Well, good morning. Welcome to our opportunity to come together as a family to, uh, to praise and worship God. You know, we have so much to celebrate, so much to be uh, excited for when it comes just to our daily walk, but to be able to come together to, uh, to take some time to slow down and to uh, praise God for, for who he is and all that he has done in our lives, you know, allowing us the opportunity to become more like his son. You know, he's endowed us with the, the gift of the spirit and we are obedient to the gospel and to live in that and to draw closer and to try to walk in his steps. And that is a, a blessing in and of itself, not only to, to, we don't have to guess, we don't have to wonder what he wants us to do. He's provided it in his word. So as we work together to become that family, as our vision says, uh, that loves God, that is all in for him with our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, everything we have to, to love him and to be there to, to serve others, to, to recognize the necessity on our part to invest in one another in and outside of the body as well as to be certain that uh, as we recognize that there are folks all around us that are seeking him, uh, we have opportunity to encourage that. And we are, we're blessed in that opportunity. And, and now as we have opportunity to come together, we're going to, uh, to begin our time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for being our God, for seeing us through even the the challenges of the last week for some were, were greater than others. And we just pray that as we strive to turn our will and our lives over to you, that, that Father, we will become just as your son was to, to look to him and his example and his disciples' example as they strove to, to, to teach us how to live a godly and right life. But God, we know that we mess up and we, uh, we so often... Uh, do the wrong instead of the right. We beg your forgiveness, but we pray that you will you'll help us to transform the way we think so that we're not living for the, the flesh, but rather for the spirit and the ways of the spirit. And help us to help those that uh, need it. And help us to, to be uh, attuned and our eyes open to, to meet those needs as we see them. God, I thank you now for the time you're giving us to, uh, to invest in uh, you and the relationship we have with you as a family. And we pray that uh, not only will we glean from the message, but we will just have the extra assurance that you are God, that you have always been there and always will be. We pray these things in your son. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, he's alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tends his skies with heavenly dew and frame the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive. From dust our God, created man, he is our God, the great I am. There was a long, long time ago, a God. Is heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, and him we live and we survive. Just our God, created man, he is our God, the great alive, in him we live, 
and we survive. From dust our God created man. He is our God, the great I am. Our God, whose son upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. Blessed our God, created man, there is a God, the great I am. Please be seated. Had one of our adults come up last week and uh, said how amazed they were with our youth group and uh, how diligent they are to, to serve and to, to represent that notion of our vision is to really be investing in and helping other people out. And uh, as somebody who's long been invested with our youth, I know that I have a deep love for them and appreciation for all they do and are. And uh, uh, today we're blessed to have one of our young men uh, present one of uh, uh first Sunday morning sermons to us, uh, and I know that uh, I'm excited to see the transformation that has occurred in him just over the last several weeks as he uh, has uh, truly just uh, blossomed and really is on fire and uh, wants to share that with you this morning as he has uh, something I've been kind of pulling on his heart and wanted to, to convey the message of things that he's been thinking about uh, and uh, share those thoughts with you. At this time, we're going to ask Caleb to come up and present a message from God's Word. Good morning, or good morning. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, am I not working? I'm working. Okay, I can't really hear. All right, hi. I'm excited to be able to stand up here and present a message from God's Word that is intended to help us grow our faith. Today, I'm going to be speaking about knowing God and that He exists. It's not just a challenge for kids my age, but for millions of adults and everyone around the world who are being misled as to who God is and how everything came into being. So this morning, I would like to start with a video that will head, help shed some light on what I'm going to lead us into this morning. Is it possible to prove that God exists? Well, probably not, but it hasn't stopped people trying over the years. You see, it's not enough for some people to believe there's a God just because it says so in a holy book. How do I know the holy book is true, they say. And the answer, because God wrote it, doesn't seem to satisfy them. Ah, but what about religious experiences, say the believers? Surely they prove that God exists. Well, not necessarily. People who say they've had religious experiences could be mistaken or making it up or mad. Science and coincidence can often explain the rest. So where does our sense of right and wrong come from, say the believers? It must come from God. Well, again, not necessarily. Humans could have worked it out for themselves. For example, if a man is living in a small community, it's not going to work if he steals someone's food, sleeps with someone's wife, or shoots someone's brother. And if he did, the rest of the community would have something to say about it, probably along the lines of, don't do that, it's wrong. While the search for solid evidence goes on, there are three main arguments that try to prove from what we already know that there is, without any doubt, a God. So let's start with the cosmological argument. 
or first cause argument, which goes like this. God must exist because who else could have made the universe? Everything has a cause. Nothing just happens. A vase doesn't smash by itself. A ball doesn't bounce by itself. A child doesn't just suddenly appear. <laughs> they all have causes. And so the argument goes, the universe must have a cause as well, a first cause. Therefore, God exists. And what caused us? We don't have to be here, but we are. So something or someone must have had a reason for creating us. Or to put it another way, the universe is big. In fact, the universe is a bigger place than it's comfortable to imagine. Each person is a tiny dot on the planet, which is an even tinier dot in the solar system, which is an even tinier dot in the galaxy, which is an even tinier dot in the universe. If we didn't exist, the cosmos wouldn't even notice. And yet, here we are. So there must be a cause. Therefore, God exists. But there are problems with this argument. It's all built on the idea that everything has a cause. So who or what caused God? And if the universe is so big, then it's highly likely that in all that space, with countless billions of planets to choose from, no. other life forms exist on some of them. And like our alien friends, we could be here just because we got lucky. The teleological argument, fortunately also known as the argument from design, states that because the world is the perfect environment for humans to live in, it must have been designed specifically with humans in mind. Therefore, God exists. In 1802, a man called William Paley had a bestseller on his hands when he wrote an explanation of the argument. It goes like this. Say you're walking in the country and you find a stone. You pick it up and look at it. It doesn't do anything, however much you shake it. The stone obviously has no purpose, so you throw it away. Walk on a bit and find a watch. You pick it up and look at it. It ticks. It has numbers. It has hands that go round. Unlike the stone, it's obvious that the watch has a purpose, and so it must have been designed by someone. Now take a look at the world. It's the perfect environment for human beings. There's air, food and water. It's the right temperature. It has the right amount of gravity and everything seems to work together to provide humans with a good home. It's obvious that it has a purpose. In fact, it's just the sort of place someone might design for humans to live in. Well, said Mr Paley, it's staring you in the face, isn't it? It was designed. Therefore, God exists. For a little while, this argument seemed to clinch it. Nice one, Mr. Paley. But then along came Charles Darwin and turned the whole argument on its head. The world, he said, wasn't made to suit people. People changed to suit the world. The earth appeared by chance, and as plants and animals grew, they adapted over millions of years to deal with what was already here. And that wasn't the only problem with the argument from design. People pointed out that design isn't perfect. There were lots of dangerous and nasty things out there. Diseases, for example, that spread without check, causing suffering and death. So if the world was designed, they said, this must be the prototype. And as a parting shot, they added, if God designed us, then who designed God? So that just about wrapped it up for the teleological argument. But there's one more to look at, the ontological argument, and it's a bit of a mind mangler. It goes like this. If God is the greatest being in the universe, then he must exist, because if he doesn't exist, he wouldn't be the greatest being in the universe. Therefore, God exists. Or to put it another way, Something that exists is greater than something that doesn't exist. So in order for God to be the greatest possible being in the universe, he must exist. The general opinion of this argument is that it's trying to confuse people into believing in God. Eminent philosophers are divided on whether it's brilliant or a bucket full of gibbon dribble. But it's not as mad as it might sound. 
describing something in a certain way can sometimes mean that it must exist. For example, the tallest man alive. Even if you had never met the tallest man alive, you would know that he exists because somewhere in the world there is a man who's taller than the second tallest man alive. Therefore, the tallest man alive must exist. Or think of how you describe a triangle, a three-sided shape. As soon as you start mucking about with the number of sides it has, it stops being a triangle. A three-sided shape is always, by definition, a triangle. So what about the description of God as the greatest possible being? Philosophers have argued that something doesn't have to exist for it to be great. Greatness is so hard to define. Someone could describe the greatest possible chocolate bar, the size of a tower block, and full of marshmallow pieces. But that doesn't mean it must exist. But if it doesn't exist, then can it really be called the greatest? And so on. But you can argue about the meaning of words as much as you like. The ontological argument doesn't prove the existence of God. These arguments have made a lot of theologians, philosophers, and scientists very famous over the years but they have failed to prove that God exists. But then no one has managed to prove that God doesn't exist either. Some would say that it's pointless to try and prove or disprove the existence of a God who is, if he exists, completely beyond our understanding anyway. In the end, what it comes down to is this. Do you believe in God or not? So let me ask, who created God? Well, believe it or not, that is a f often researched question. And as the video and research shows that there are three main arguments for the existence of God. So the first one we're gonna to touch on is the cosmological argument. So the cosmological argument attempts to show that the universe could not have created itself nor sustained itself, but it must be caused and is currently being sustained by some agent that was neither part of the universe nor was itself caused. So it's long been said that every cause has an effect and this is simply referring to the law of cause and effect. But as mentioned, who or what created God, what caused him, some may ask. See, there are two truths to the cosmological argument that attempts to convince the unbeliever to acknowledge and they are something or someone caused the universe to come into existence and someone, something is keeping the universe existing right now. So if we can get the skeptic consider uh, these two points is true, or at least possible, then we have removed barriers that provide the unbeliever with reasons or excuses for rejecting the possibility, possibility of the existence of God. When these excuses no longer exist, the unbeliever has no grounds or at least fewer grounds for hiding, fighting the Holy Spirit's calling. So we can lead them to scripture that tells us in, uh, whoops. In Psalms 19, one through two, it said, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day, he pours forth speech and at night to night reveals knowledge. Then in Colossians 1, 16 through 17, it says, for by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. So these, these scriptures right here are just telling about how God has already been here. He is eternal and he has created things. It, it goes back to saying that God did not have anything to start him. And he holds things together just like the video was asking. Later in Isaiah 40, 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the end? The ends of the, he of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. And then Revelations 22, 13, I am the Alpha the um, and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning of the ends. These scriptures answer the question of where God came from and that he is eternal and he's always been there. Next, we're going to go to the teleological argument that discussed that the world was created uh, Therefore, there must be a designer. 
So for example, when we look at the world around us, there are so many precise things that could not have just happened by chance. God's precision is shown in how we are able to maintain life because of the forethought as to how even the slightest difference in any of the following would not allow for the continuation of life. You know that if that life on earth would not be possible if the tilt of earth were greater or less, the distance of the earth from the, from the sun was greater or less, if earth's gravitational interaction with the moon were greater or less, if the earth's surface gravity were greater or less, and if the length of the day were longer or shorter, uh, I like to touch on, you know, in Alaska, how they have night for about a month. See, that would be incredibly hard to continue life if there was no sun for an entire month. Uh, and even going back to the, the gravity, if you were on a plane and you were just flying, you'd fly straight into space if there was no gravity to hold the plane down. So again, we, we see the one who created life and, and his own words points us towards in... Whoops. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. He is that designer. He created us and everything around us for a reason. And sometimes we forget, ignore, or deny that he is the reason for it all. Uh, Job even received a reminder as to God's might and power. I know you guys can't read this one, but as Job 38, uh, four through seven said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have any understanding who set its measurements since you know, or stretched it on the line on what words its basis songs or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now Job wasn't there in the beginning. All things were instead brought into being by God's hand, but God said, Job and all of mankind is without excuse. After all, he has given us everything we need to know of the knowledge of who he is, what he has done, and what he is doing. That's what Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans 1, 18 through 23. He said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that is which known about as God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood, though, or through what has been made, or my bad. No, nope. <laughs> being understood through what has been made, so they are out with, without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him or even give thanks. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of the corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So God makes it evident to all of us that we, not that we have to guess, but it's obvious that since the start of our time, he has made himself known. So we are no longer to have any excuse to think otherwise. So not seeing God in the creation of the universe is no different than watching than, than men watching Christ or one of the apostles doing miracles and still not believing. So in, in John 12, 37, it said, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were still not believing in him. God has made his existence known and men still don't believe in him or man doesn't still believe in him, but he will let you live a lie. God will let you believe that lie that we tell ourselves because he has given us free will. It all comes back to faith in God or something else. What will you put your faith in? Jack, can you help me out? <laughs> all right. And again, in Hebrews 11, uh, 1, it says, Now faith is a certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. And Genesis 1, 1 through 3. said, in the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth. The earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So will you believe in God and his word that he is the designer or the creator? Our final argument uh, is going to be the ontological. And that's God's the most powerful being. Therefore, he must exist. So verses on uh, God being the most powerful being, 
I'm going to start us off in Romans 4, 17. It said, as it is written, I have made you a father many nations. In the presence of him who believed, that is God, who gives life to the dead and calls things into, into being that did not exist. And again, in Revelations, whoops. <laughs> Revelations 4, 11, it says, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things because of your will, and they existed and they were created. So just these two verses here convey the whole ontological argument about how the video said that it doesn't add up. Well, in the Bible, it does tell us that God is the most powerful being, and he created. So I'm going to slip in a little moral argument based on, you know, our moral compass of how we know things are wrong or right. You know, in the video, they talked about, you know, murder, and they talked about, uh, you know, adultery and stuff like that. How did we know that was wrong without God telling us that? It just doesn't add up because humans will not come up with those laws by themselves. They won't say that, oh, yeah, because I said that killing is wrong. It's wrong. Others are going to say, well, who are you to tell me that's wrong? There has to be an authority figure to tell you what your moral compass is going to be. So in Romans 2, 14, 16, it said, for the Gentiles who do not have law instinctively perform the requirements of the law, though these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of mankind through Jesus Christ. So, oops, my bad. So what are we going to do with what we have learned about God and his daily presence in our lives? Why don't we believe because if we do, then why are we not living like it? You know, in, in the Bible, it, it talks about uh, prostitutes and tax collectors getting to heaven before Christians, before people that believed in God, people that didn't give their full faith to God and didn't live as he said. So if they, if prostitutes and sinners can get it and repent, why don't we? Because they will get into heaven before us. So what will you believe in the world or the word of God? So finally, I'm going to wrap it up with 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. It said, for after all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted, along with us when Lord Jesus will be revealed from the heavens with his might, mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These people will pay the penalty of eternal destruction and be away from the presence of the Lord and from his glory and power. And as Christians, this should be a bigger deal to us because we were given everything we needed. We were given the word of God. And if we don't obey, then how much more will the Lord punish us, his followers, for not living in the gospel? So before I wrap this up, I do want to talk about science because I didn't add any of the science into this. And I have been reading a book recently about how everything came into being, just as I have preached this. So a lot of science, I remember when I was learning science, even in middle school, starting up to high school, I was taught that so many things were, you know, against religion. And a lot of what we learn in high school is that if you have a religion, then your opinion is not valid and that you're unintelligent. But recent studies have actually shown that there is a lot more pointing towards a creator than we actually know. And I challenge you to go and look up certain things. Look up how science points towards a creator because there's no physics, like no laws of physics can show how the earth would have came into play. You, I'm gonna challenge you guys to go look on that in yourself. But reading this book has, you know, even stretched, stretched my faith even further after I've written this. So Lastly, I'm going to say, what will you put your faith in? What will you do with the message I've given you? Will you believe and obey as he has commanded you, or will you live according to the world? So we're going to call up an invitation. If you have any need, uh, Rob will come up and talk to you in the front, or if you want, we could have an elder come to the back. Um, you know, I hope that my word has inspired everyone here in this room, and I hope that we've all grown in faith today. Uh, 
So with that word, I'm going to pass it on and we're going to sing a song of encouragement. Please stand. <clears throat> he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him in that day? One day, new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Please be seated. Good morning as we come before the Lord's table, um, I'll be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at the 23rd verse. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let us pray before we partake of the, the emblems. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful to be here today. Uh, thankful for um, uh, today's lesson. Thankful for um, just the power of youth and, and, and coming of age and understanding with what you have uh, put into our lives, dear Heavenly Father, your word. And we just thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance in the Bible. Um, and, and thank you for, for j just putting us in a world where we can see your power and your glory every day. We just uh, thank you so much for uh, the bread which you're about to receive and the fruit of the vine. We just uh, pray that we will be mindful as we uh, partake of it, um, that uh, of the sin in our lives, that we would uh, take every precaution to, to get rid of that sin, to change our lives so that we can live a life according to your will and that we can serve you in a manner that you would see fit there, my Father. We just thank you for, for Jesus being willing to die on that cross for, for each and every one of us, dear Heavenly Father, to uh, remove that sin that, that so entangles our lives, to give us a chance at sharing in the eternity with you. We just uh, thank you for our church here in Ankeny and for all the many blessings we have in our family here. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
how good is God? Uh, I appreciate Caleb's words. I know that uh, so often we can get lost in our own world and forget that uh, this world is created by God. And it's not anything that we had anything to do with. He uh, is the, the beginning and end, the creator of all. And uh, we should feel confident and assured in the fact that uh, he has always been there and always will be. And uh, I pray that as we live our lives, we live it in light of the fact that we serve a God who has not only created us, but has this immense love for us. He doesn't want us to be without him and for others who are, are seeking to have some kind of hope and assurance in their life that we don't neglect the opportunity to share that faith with them. Uh, let's close our, our time with a prayer. Father God, I do come humbly before you and, and thank you for the opportunity you've allowed us as your family to, to praise and glorify you and to, to rest assured that you are God and that not only do you exist, but that you sustain us, you keep us going, you allow us to, to have our every breath and we thank you. We thank you for that love that you have for us, not only to bring that into creation, but to, to give us your son. It gives us the reason to, to live not only now, but for all eternity. And we pray that in light of that, we will live our lives in such a way that we will continue to strive to be like him and to allow others to, to know that love that we have for you and that you have for us as we strive to help there, to, to be there for each other and to, to make certain that those who are seeking you will come to know you. We thank you for all you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Before we close, uh, there are no birthdays this week that I'm aware of. If there is one, I apologize. I, I missed it. But uh, for those who are wondering, you know, well, how do you know if uh, we have a birthday? Uh, part of that is just getting online and registering. So if you've never created, uh, gone into our website and, and gone online to register, we want to encourage you to do that. So not only can know your email and your address and how to get in touch with you and some of the general things, even down to your, your birthday, so we can celebrate that with you. Uh, but uh, it's just a way for us to to have an account for each other. So when people are like, do you know so-and-so's address to say, if you check the website, easy way to do that. And that is member accessible and it's not just for anybody in the world to have access to, but uh, so we do keep all that information uh, secured. But I wanna encourage you if you haven't done that to go online and uh, register. If you're struggling to do that, you're computer illiterate, like maybe uh, some people that I know in the congregation would say they are, um, don't hesitate, reach out to somebody. We'd be glad to help you uh, to set that up. Um, the other announcement is a uh, small group. We have uh, all the teens come. We're going to have everybody over to the house tonight with the weather finally have, have broken. We're going to play some outdoor games if the yard isn't a, a crazy, a muddy mess, but we're still going to do it anyway. So uh, come prepared for that. We're going to have hot dogs and uh, Kimberly's famous mac and cheese, which everybody will be looking forward to. And uh, we'll have some, uh, if you guys want to bring some sides to go with that, chips or drinks, uh, encourage. That's 4.30 to 7.30. And you're like, hey, I'm not a team, but I'd love to be able to uh, be a chaperone or a mentor to them. Feel free to come along as well. Um, we also have our college age kids. Uh, if you are, are not part of our, our Bible study and you're like, you know what, I like to get more invested in the, the college age, come over to our house as well on Monday night. And that's going to be from five to eight. Uh, and we'll probably have something similar to eat, but we'll see what we do. But uh, so if you're thinking, you know what, uh, I fit into that category. I'm like, you know, in the, the 20, 25 or a little bit older range. Uh, we want to get you guys connected so we can uh, grow and be able to disciple each other. Uh, those are the announcements that I'm aware of, unless you're considering the blessing box. And I know that those are, we always have the need to, to continue to be certain that our, our community is, is well fed, that nobody is, is starving. So uh, if you haven't brought in, not just those, but also any hygiene products or the like, we do have a new resource room that has been created downstairs to, to house those things. We appreciate everybody who took the time and energy to, to the creation of that so that we can continue to, to meet some of the needs as they come up. And if you're thinking, well, I have some extra stuff, get in touch with Doris and she will say yay or nay or uh, Pat or who else is in Ryla and Kelly. So you have four people to get in touch with, say, hey, this is meet the need of what we're looking for. Uh, so that we can continue to, to strive to, uh, to be a blessing to our community. Uh, was there something else, Doris, in regard to that? Okay. So Ruth Harbor, as you guys know, uh, we've been working with them, and I know that we're going to have a spring clean coming up, but also there's other opportunities to do some, uh, some training for the ladies who are there. And a an email had been sent out, and if you didn't catch it, uh, get in touch with myself or Doris or... Uh, 
uh, yeah, myself or Doris, and we'll get some information back to you in regard to that. Uh, but there are plenty of opportunities for us to continue to invest uh, our, our faith and our time and our energies into so many others. And I pray that that's what we do. I don't know that there's any other announcements. So um, you guys are dismissed. Have a blessed week.